The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Um, today is a workshop on presenting uh, mathematics, one of the two basic forms of communication that we have in this subject, the other one being writing, uh, and a workshop on that is going to happen this Friday here also. That'll be a possibly two hour long workshop. We have that one to three slot on Fridays. So it'll be a little more extended than this one, which is just last week took two. So uh, let me turn this over to Susan, who will take it from here. So I have just handed out a description of a talk that meets basic expectations, a good talk, and an excellent talk. These are from a past semester of 18821. Basically, uh, a talk that meets basic expectations, the math is correct for all of these, the math is correct. The math has to be correct. Um, the math is correct and the audience can perceive what is being said, what is being presented. So the visuals are visible and speech is audible. You're not talking to the as you present. That meets basic expectations. A good talk communicates effectively. So if the audience is uh, paying attention, then they can follow it and understand what is being presented. And an excellent talk is easy to pay attention to because it's interesting. So that's the basic idea. Um, you can think about that as you see two sample presentations, one by Nat and one by Saul. Decide which one you like better. Try to actually understand the content. So which is, are they effective? Do you learn from them? Are they interesting? Uh, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, well, thank you for letting me talk today. I'm going to be talking about uh, the project that my team's been working on for the last several weeks. And that is knots and colorability. So I guess it would be best if I begin with the definition of a knot. Well, an oriented knot. is a differentiable function k from r to r3 that satisfies some properties. The first property is that k of x equals k of y if and only if x minus y is an integer. So this says that we really are looking at a map from a circle into R3, and it's not allowed to intersect itself anywhere. The second property is that the derivative of k can't be 0. So if that's an oriented knot, uh, what's a knot? Well, we get a knot by forgetting about the orientation, or in other words, I identifying uh, k of t with k of minus t. That's how we get a knot uh, from an oriented knot. We really like to think about a knot as its image inside of R3, which is some kind of twisted up loop. But what does it mean for two knots to be the same? Well, there's another definition here. Two knots are the same. Two knots are the same if they are what's known as ambient isotopic. And this means that there's some differentiable function f from r cross 0, 1 to r cubed uh, with the property that f sub t is always a knot 
And if my two knots were k0 and k1, then f sub 0 equals k0, and f sub 1 equals k1. So that's, that's a notion of sameness uh, for knots. But usually we like to think about knots in terms of their projections onto a plane. Uh, and when we do that, we like to graphically represent them like this, where uh, if one part of the loop is above the other, we just put it above like this to symbolize that it's above and the other one is below. And we call such a thing a knot diagram. Now, it's an old theorem of Reidemeister's that two knots are ambient isotopic if and only if when I draw the two knot diagrams corresponding to those knots, I can get from one to the other via some things called Reitemeister moves that I just happen to have on the board right here. So we have the two knot diagrams, and the two knots corresponding to them are ambient isotopic if I can get from one to the other by either unlooping a loop like this or um, passing one part of a loop over another, like R2 says here, or by taking a strand like this and passing it over a crossing, which is what happens in R3 here. We've taken the bottom strand and passed it over the crossing. OK, so that's some history and the definitions. Um, but now I want to get to the stuff that I'm most interested in, the stuff that we really worked on, which is colorability. So the definition is the following. <clears throat> a coloring is an assignment assignment of one of three colors so we could call them red, green, and blue to the strands of a knot to the strands of a knot diagram such that at each crossing so a crossing is a place where two strands meet, uh, where, where, two, where one um, part of the knot passes over another. Uh, at each crossing, <clears throat> the colors are all the same or different. Well, that's a kind of stupid definition, because if I have any knot diagram, well, I could just color every strand the same color. And uh, that would be a coloring. So we need some notion of a non-trivial coloring. And uh, the right thing to say there is that a coloring is non-trivial uh, if more than one color is used. So um, this brings us to the main result of our work these last few weeks, which is the following theorem. And it says, if a knot diagram for a particular knot is non-trivially colorable, then every knot diagram for the knot is non-trivially colorable. So how does one go about proving such a thing? 
Well, the trick is to use Reitemeister's theorem that I told you about a little bit ago. We have these three different operations that we can do to a knot diagram, and we need to show that coloring is preserved under these. So if you look at them, uh, R1 and R2 are just trivial. Um, but R3 is the interesting bit, because there's five cases here. So let me show you how some of them go. Let's see here. <clears throat> to draw this. Well, we could have uh, the following coloring. Red, blue, green. Um, blue, red, uh, blue. OK? That is a good coloring. Um, and so that is a non-trivial, that's part of a non-trivial coloring of some knot. And now I just need to <coughs> color this bit. And how do I do it? Well, there's blue on this big strand, so I put a blue here. And then this has got to be red, uh, and this has got to be blue. Um, and uh, let's see here. Red. This has got to be red, and this has got to be, this one has got to be blue. So red, blue, this has got to be green. And that worked. There we go. So there is uh, one case. And let me just show you another one um, so that you get the idea. So in this case, let's see if we can make, have none of the intersections be the same colors. We'll have uh, red, blue, green, uh, and then let's have blue, red, green. There we go. And here we go. So again, this long one is blue, so this has got to be blue. And uh, this has got to be blue. And this is red. And this down here is red. And so we see that this has got to be blue, so this one had better be green. And that's right. Uh, and that completes, so, so there's three more cases, but they're just like that. And that basically completes the proof. That's what we've accomplished. And Are there any questions? Did you ever define what a strand was? Oh, a strand is just, is just in the knot diagram, a strand is just one of these segments. Yeah. Can you give an example of a knot which is not colorable? Not non trivially colorable? Um, well, uh, oh, I guess, actually, I heard that the figure eight knot has that property. Uh, but I can't remember. I can't really remember how that goes. I don't really like drawing knots. Uh, OK. So should I put my two questions up? Yes, there is a quiz. Right here. OK, so question one. Question two, so question one is, can you figure that one out? Um, and question two is, in two sentences, uh, or less, try and explain 
why colorability is interesting or important. these questions and also feel free to jot down your notes of your impressions of this talk because we'll talk about both of the talks after they've both been given. So what was question one? It was, what, what does that correspond? Apply the third right of mice remove and try mm -hmm. and color it. Do this piece of the proof. Oh, no. The purpose of these questions is to help you understand how well you understood the talk, because it's easy to think that you understood a talk and then realize that maybe perhaps you didn't really understand it as well as you thought you did. It's more important to jot down your thoughts about the talk than to complete answering the questions. So our second presentation. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here talking to you all. So the project I've been working with my team for a few weeks is entitled Knots and Colorability. And the main subject of the talk is colorability of knots, but um, before that, I think I'd better say a few words about knots. So what is a knot? Well, it's basically what you think it is. It's like a closed loop of string in space that might be tangled up in itself somehow. So let me give you a couple of examples. So here's the simplest possible knot. It's not tangled at all. It's just a loop. And we call it the unknot. And even the simplest non-trivial knot is slightly difficult to draw, so I'm going to um, copy it from my notes. We call this the trefoil. So the central question of knot theory is to classify knots. Give a list of all the knots that there are. Well, obviously we need an idea of when two knots are the same. For instance, if I draw this knot, well, it's sort of clear that this is really just the unknot with a loop moved over itself. Um, so we have to say what we mean for two knots to be the same. And what we mean is just that one can somehow be bent and wrestled into the other without tearing it or passing it through itself. And the goal of knot theory is to classify knots up to this idea of sameness. So. As you can see, um, we work really not with the full knots in three-dimensional space, but with these sorts of diagrams. And it's easy to tell um, from one of these diagrams how you could pull it out of the blackboard and form a genuine space knot. Um, so a great theorem of knot theory tells us that when <laughs> Whenever two knot diagrams represent the same knot, they can be related by a very simple series of moves. These are the Weidemeister moves, which I just happen to have here. So Weidemeister's theorem states that If two knot diagrams, by which I mean these um, two-dimensional drawings which have just slid the board over, represent the same knot, then they can be related 
by a sequence of moves of these types over there. So you can see fairly easily that none of these moves um, really change the knot in any important way. I mean, this is just untwisting a loop. This is, well, those two strands just happen to be lying on top of each other. Let's pull them apart. And this is just moving this segment here over that crossing. Doesn't make any difference. Um, the real meat of Weidemeister's theorem is the claim that no matter how convoluted the two knot diagrams were, if they did represent the same knot, then you can always relate them by these three simple moves. So that's a way of proving that two knots are the same. It's comforting that you only have to use these moves. But how do you show that two knots are not the same? If we want to classify all knots, we'd better be able to say that the R knot and the trefoil are different. So Weidemeister's theorem doesn't give an algorithm. Um, it could be that if two simple knot diagrams represent the same knot, then there's no way of getting from one to the other without passing through a much more com it, there could be no way of passing through from one to the other without passing through a much more complicated knot. So you can't prove that the trefoil is not the same as the unknot by saying, well, I tried the Weidemeister moves and I failed. We need something more powerful, and that's the idea of a knot invariant. So what's a knot invariant? Well, it's really a property of a knot diagram that can hopefully be read off from a knot diagram in a relatively clean and easy way. And we want it to be shared by all diagrams representing the same knot. And if this property turned out to be different for this diagram and this diagram, then we really would know that the trapo and the unknot were different. So are there any questions about this? Great. So I want to introduce a particular knot invariant. called colorability. And that's the work that's been done over the past few weeks in my group. So here's a definition. A coloring of a knot is a way of assigning a color to each strand. So what's a strand? Well, a strand is an unbroken piece of the string on the page. Um, it moves from one undercrossing to another undercrossing. So this is an example of a strand. This is a strand from here to here, but the strand doesn't continue over here because there's a crossing. So each one of those gets a color. Um, it gets one of three colors which I have here. Say red, green, or blue. And this can't just be any coloring of the strands. It has to have a certain property. So that property is any crossing. So here's an example of a crossing. Um, that's one strand passing over the top of 
well, another part of the knot which is then broken into two strands. So we have potentially three separate strands here. And there are three colors we could give them. So we want to insist that the colors are all different. So all of red, green, and blue are represented, or all the same. So let me draw you some examples of colored crossings. Here's one that's allowed. So let me give that a tick. So the colors are allowed to be all different, but they're also allowed to be all the same. So this is also perfectly good. And um, let me give you one non-example. If I had done my coloring and I ended up with a crossing that looked like this, I'd have made a mistake because there's two of one color and only one of another. All right. So any notch has this kind of coloring. You can just color the whole knot, say, blue, and every crossing will look like this. So at this point, whether or not it's colorable or not um, isn't a very interesting invariant. We have to impose another condition. We call a coloring non-trivial. Non if more than one color is used. And finally, we call a knot, or really a knot diagram, colorable if it has a non-trivial coloring. So what about the knots we've already drawn? Well, the unknot only has one strand. Um, so you can color any color you like, but you've still only used one color. So that's a trivial coloring. So the unknot is not colorable. What about the trefoil? Well, there are three strands, and at every one of these three crossings, all of the strands meet. So if we just make these three strands three different colors, we should be fine. I'm hoping the colors aren't too faint to be seen here. But we can see that each of these three crossings, if the colors are visible, visibly features exactly one of each of the three colors. OK, so this is colorable. And the theorem that we proved in this project is the following. Coloring really is a not invariant. Sorry, colorability. So that means, again, that if two knot diagrams represent the same knot, then they're either both colorable or both not colorable. So that theorem, if it's true, implies that these two knot diagrams definitely don't represent the same knot. So how do you prove that? Well, because of Reidemeister's theorem, which is written up there, it's enough to show that each one of the Reidemeister moves doesn't change the property of colorability. Because if two diagrams represent the same knot, you can get from one to the other using Reidemeister moves. And if colorability isn't changed at each step, then it's not changed over the whole process. So at this point, to prove the theorem, you have to split into a lot of cases um, for each Reidemeister move. And some of them contain several cases. And check each one of them and check that colorability is conserved. So it would be tedious to all, do all that. But let me show you a couple of cases to give you a flavor. So. Suppose you've got a knot that's colorable. You're going to apply a Reidemeister move to it. So, you know, K 
chaos, you know, elemental chaos is going on in this knot. Could be absolutely anything. But we've identified a section of the knot where we can apply a Rydermeister move. Say that section looks like this. So let's zoom in. Sorry, that's green. So after we've applied the Rydermeister move R2 to this little section, we get something that looks like this. And we want to show that this can be colored consistently with the way the knot was colored before. So this strand obviously leaves this bubble and goes on being blue outside the bubble. And we haven't changed that, so it has to be blue going into the bubble. And it just continues here. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, in the meantime, this strand was green at both ends outside the bubble, so that has to be conserved. So these two strands, which are remnants of this strand, have to be colored green. So at each of these crossings, we have um, a green and a blue strand, so the remaining strand has to be red. So everything matches up nicely. And note that if it was a non-trivial coloring before, then it's still a non-trivial coloring. Let me just do one more example of this. And perhaps let me bring back the Rydermeister moves for reference. Suppose you had um, a little bubble like this that looked like the before part of the Rydermeister move R3. And you've colored it in a certain way. So let's do this. You can see with your eyes that this is a valid coloring. So now we apply the Rydermeister move R3. But I'm going to draw it in such a way as to preserve the points of entry of the strands. So this strand is um, it's still lying over everything, but now it's been pushed up across this crossing. Um, this strand goes in like this, comes up over here. And this strand goes as follows. Well, this one's definitely still red. That can't have changed. And let's, again, fill in the colors where they're forced by what the strands are doing outside the bubble. So these two are coming in blue. And these two are coming in green. And then I only have one strand left to color, so I'd better be able to find a color that works. And that color is green. So that's fine. Um, and again, if this was a non-trivial coloring, then this is still a non-trivial coloring. So there are many more cases, but none of them are any more difficult than this. And that's how you prove this theorem. So the trefoil and the unknot really are different. And I think that's where I'll stop. Are there any questions? Off the top of my head, I can't say anything. Me and my team didn't get to that. I'm sorry. Yes? Um, why is it obvious that every knot has one of these diagonals? Like, what if you have like, an infinite amount of oscillation or something, like two strands over each other? Good question. I mean, proving that does require some analysis. You've got to, um, I, I think it's something like um, if a generic projection um, 
Well, I think first you have to insist your knot is tame in that it has a regular neighborhood in R3. And then you can prove a theorem that says something like, um, if you choose a projection from R3 onto R2, then with probability 1, it will take your knot onto one of these okay, things. So but that's, if your oscillation is like in some bad plane, you just choose a different plane. Yeah. Okay. But that's non-trivial to prove. Yeah, Matt. Uh, can you give an example of a non-trivial knot with a non-trivial coloring? Yes. Um, in fact, I looked one up before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm going to copy it from my notes because it's slightly non-trivial to draw. This is the figure eight knot. <laughs> it looks like this. OK, so this knot has four strands. And um, it has four crossings. And um, at each of these crossings, three different strands meet. So OK, by the pigeonhole principle, at least two of these strands have to have the same color. Say this color is red. Um, so I'm just going to choose a random two strands and say that they're red. Um, you'll have to trust me that this doesn't really depend on which two strands I choose. So say it's these two. OK, well, then two of these strands meet at some crossing. So the remaining strand is determined. And because they're both red, it has to be red. OK, and now um, the you know, red has totally taken over. Um, everything has got to be red. So any coloring of this knot is trivial. So in fact, the um, colorability proves that the trefoil is different from the unknot, but it doesn't prove that this figure eight is different from the unknot. You need a stronger knot invariant for that. All right. Thank you very much. OK, we don't have time to uh, go through the questions again, so I'm just going to ask you, how many of you, now that you've had the experience of trying to answer the questions for the earlier talk, how many of you think you would be able to answer the first question more easily after seeing the second talk than after seeing the first? OK, and how about the second question? OK. Um, and which one did you like better, first talk or second talk? First talk? One, and second talk. <laughs> okay, pretty much everyone else. It is relevant and important that there is one person who preferred the first talk. Audiences vary, and you cannot know with certainty how your audience is going to react, um, or that your audience, you can, you can do everything perfectly, and not everyone will like your talk. So now the question is, how can you give an excellent talk when it's your turn to give a talk. Um, but first let me ask, let's, let's rank these like with the um, meets expectations. You could see it, you could hear it. It was good, you could learn from it. Or it was excellent, it was easy to pay attention. So did they meet expectations? How many of you think the first one, you could see it, you could hear it? It met basic expectations. How about the second one? OK, they both met basic expectations. How many of you could learn from, could understand, if you paid attention, the first one? OK, most of you. So it was good. How many of you could understand the second one, if you paid attention? OK, it was good. How many of you had an easy time paying attention to the first one? Because it was interesting. So it was excellent. Eh, not so many, some. How about the second one? Pretty much all of you. OK. So the second one is what you're aiming for, more or less. Um, how do you give an excellent talk? So what was it that made the second one better? He, I think there are two things that he did um, a lot. The first one he did very little of, which is that he motivated things that he said. And he worried about like the motivation and understanding at a conceptual level more than the formalism. And he also gave examples that kind of communicated, or like 
we're sort of shortcuts to completely parsing the definitions. So it was conceptual. It was in many places informal, um, which raises a question. When should a math talk be informal? When should things be presented conceptually? And when should it be formal and rigorous? In the case of this, like a knot is a standard, well-defined thing. So giving a formal definition of a knot isn't that important, since the conceptual thing was more than sufficient to understand the talk, and you could just look it up when we went home afterwards. Yeah. If it were some kind of very, if it were some kind of novel thing, then giving the formalism might be more important because it would be harder for people to like catch up on that later. So um, the most important takeaway here, it's a common misconception uh, that students have uh, perhaps from the lectures they hear in their classes, which are a different context. Students come in thinking that math talks must be formal and rigorous throughout, and that is not the case here. Um, I, the context is different in that uh, this is not a lecture. In classes, you need to learn, the students need to learn everything so that they can build on it. This is a different context. You are talking about your research and your audience is interested, but they don't have to pay attention. They don't have to learn. So it's more like, uh, I think of it as mathematical entertainment. Um, your audience is here, they want to learn something interesting. So give them something interesting which means you don't have to present all of your research. Decide what of your work you think is most likely to be interesting to your audience and focus on that. You, don't, you will not have time to present everything that you did. Other thoughts about how to give an excellent talk? OK. Um, we are going to be doing practice presentations. It's not easy to give an excellent talk, and we will give you a lot of feedback on your practice presentation. So I'm just going to say a little bit about the process, a process that I suggest you use before the practice presentation. So this is a big picture process for preparing an excellent talk. Um, as with any communication, it begins with analyzing the rhetorical context. Who is the audience? What is the purpose? And what are the constraints? We already talked about the purpose. This is. Uh, Mathematical entertainment, this is not a class lecture. The constraints, it's um, one class period, so that's 45 minutes, about 15 minutes per person, plus five minutes for Q&A. And you may use a combination of chalk and slides. We expect you to use primarily um, chalk talk on the blackboards, but you can use slides. Uh, there are all sorts of pitfalls with slides, so if you are going to use slides, those slides must be prepared in time for the practice presentation. And your audience, Haynes, could you say a few words about who the audience is? Your audience is each other. And he's going to tell you what the background is of the audience. Uh, yeah. So, I, for, first of all, I'd like to say that there's a whole lot more to say about these two examples of talks than yes. you any chance. I wish we had another hour because uh, we could go through each one of them in detail and talk about what worked and what didn't work. Uh, in fact, I think I'll do that. Um, I will write my own notes. I took notes on these two talks, and I'll write my own impressions and my own critique of them and send them around to you. And you can decide for yourself whether you agree with, with what I had to say or not. Actually, I'd like to hear your responses to that. Susan uh, mentioned the fact that there's a, there's an audience here. The, your, your talks will be to this class. You are your audience. Uh, but that's not very well defined because uh, you guys are, most of you are math majors. 
Uh, that means to get into the class, you had a couple of courses numbered 100 and above, but uh, nobody here has had exactly the same classes. I think the only common element is probably linear algebra. Uh, so don't get too technical. People, some people are interested in computer science, some people are interested in physical applied math, some people are interested in theory. Don't get too technical. I didn't think these were too technical for the most part, but uh, so it's like that. Thank you. So once you've analyzed the rhetorical context, then uh, for process, what I suggest you do before the practice presentation is ask yourself what's interesting. And that means what will be interesting to the audience. It all comes back to the audience. Everything does. And choose what you're going to focus on based on what's interesting in your research. Then what are the prereqs? And again, this depends on the audience. You will have spent weeks on your project. And it's going to be, um, you're going to be so comfortable with the basics that you're going to be, you are likely to forget that your audience needs to be told those basics. Include the basics. Try to remember what it was like when you first started learning, working on the project. What did you need to understand in order to make progress? Give those, give that background. And then um, the pre-corrects that are needed not only to understand the content, but also to understand why it's important. And then how to sequence. How can you sequence and present the information? Don't necessarily do all of the background, all the definitions at the beginning like happened in the first talk. That tends to be boring. It's more interesting to introduce terms in, in context. And an effective way, um, one strategy you can use to make it interesting is to do the question, answer, question, answer, or problem, solution, problem, solution. Raise a question in the minds of your audience and then give the answer, which leads to another question, and so on. That's one way to make a talk engaging. Then ask yourself, uh, once you've figured out the sequence, how are you going to start? That's going to got to be the most interesting question of all to get people's interest. How do you end? How do you let everyone know that the talk is over? And what are you going to have them take away from the end of the talk? And transitions. And finally, practice. Feel free to practice even before you practice with us. And this is all, of course, um, it's not necessarily linear. You often go back to earlier steps as you go through this process. Any questions? I wish this class were twice as long. <laughs> OK, we'll see you in your practice presentations. Thank you.